I'm Pedro da Costa, Editorial Fellow at the Peterson Institute for International Economics. I'm joined by Joseph Gagnon and Tam Bayumi, Senior Fellows here at the Institute. Uh, so we're going to talk about the Bank of Japan's recent uh, inaction and the market's reaction. Uh, you guys wrote a blog recently telling Mr. Kuroda to be bold. And essentially, you're telling him to go big or go home. Um, why do you think the Bank of Japan has become so hesitant after what seemed to be a pretty aggressive uh, you know, series of actions by Governor Kuroda once he took the helm of the BOJ? Yeah, you know, that's, that's a wonderful question. I don't fully know the answer myself, but I can certainly speculate. I think uh, there, when they moved to negative interest rate in January, there was a lot of um, public criticism of that and political uh, uh, c complaints, which I think they're still dealing with and trying to figure out how to, how to respond. Uh, I'm not quite sure why they didn't move more on the other side, which is the quantitative easing, because uh, I don't sense any public reaction against that. Uh, so I'm a bit puzzled um, as to why. So what do you think were the, were the bank's biggest well, mistakes? Well, I think that Joe sort of hit the nail on the head, although I put it in a slightly different way. I think that they thought that moving to negative rates was a big move, and the fact that it didn't work sort of then made them gun shy. Actually, I think the truth of the matter is it's a fairly small move. And the market's read it as such, and which is why the market's yeah, read it as, even though it was sort of dramatic in terms of actually moving to negative rates, which of course the governor had said he would not do, it was which such again, a small was another move. messaging error, right? Mm. Yeah, and, and but then he suddenly turned around and did it, but did it not very big. So oh, yeah. sort of in a sense, if you're going to do that kind of thing, you know, kind of make it make it serious or don't do it sort of thing. So, Joe, uh, I know that you've argued in, in papers and in, in, in the blog recently that the Bank of Japan and other central banks are not, in fact, out of ammunition. So what would you propose that they do in the face of continued deflation or continued disinflationary forces, at least, and their inability to hit their inflation target over the years? Yeah, so, so what I would say is that they, they were bold initially and then got good results initially. The core inflation has come way up from before Kuroda got in office. But uh, nobody knows exactly how much is, in, is enough. Nobody knows exactly how much is needed. Uh, and they needed another push, sort of one more push to get over the line, as it were. And, and, and for the past six months, they've been de uh, delaying. And I don't know quite why, but what they could do uh, aside from even more negative interest rates, and they could try to cushion some of the effect by both lending and borrowing at negative rates, so banks you know, have access to cheap funding as well as, as a negative rate on their deposits. But they could also so do more of that, but also they could um, do more quantitative easing. And in particular, I think what would really d help now would be to go into other assets, because it, the long-term bonds they're buying, they've pushed uh, rates down very low to zero negative rates on those, and I think probably can't get much more on that. And they have a broader mandate the Federal, than the Federal Reserve does, right? They, they have a broader range of assets they can purchase. They can. With the government's approval, they can purchase anything. And they, they are, a little bits. Uh, but what they should really do is ramp up, I think, equities and possibly the real estate, but especially the equities they're buying. They could buy a lot more. There's plenty of room. And that would really send a signal you know, to markets that, oh, they're serious. This is, this is big, big time if they did it in a big way. What do you think, Tam? I mean, there's a lot of the critics of QE point to Japan as a, a place that kind of tried and failed. Here was an experiment where they went for it, and they, after 20 years of hesitation, they finally did QE and they went for it, and they and it failed. How do you see that? Do you think they should continue? Is that a doubling down of of a mistaken policy in a way? No, I don't think it is. Uh, I agree with you that the perception of the before Abenomics was that one of the problems that uh, had happened in Japanese policy making was that they tried to do things but then they kept on saying oh well we'll just stop it as soon as we can and that that isn't the message you want to send you want to be bold and you want to carry on being bold I think that Abenomics started that way but then I think hes hesitancy started coming in and the April tax hike from last year was kind of a first sign, Yes, exactly. Sign, the, right? Sort or... of a first sign that... And what's happened, is, uh, as was mentioned, is that over the last six months, essentially, they haven't really... Having brought core inflation up from minus 1% to plus 
which is a big deal. A 2% change in core inflation is a big deal. Having done that and having apparently been successful, they kind of lost their nerve. They backpedal. Yeah. yeah. And that, I think, is the thing, which is that rather than once they were seeing success carrying on, yeah. they saw success, but then they started getting cold feet. I want to go back to your point from earlier, Joe, and I want both of you guys to chime in on this because in a way, uh, Japan is, is, a, is a unique case because uh, Abe, in a sense, was elected to push for this Abenomics, right? And so there was a sense of, of fiscal monetary cooperation and there was a sense of public approval for aggressive monetary easing you know, and in a way that there hadn't been before. But now the, the public support seems to have retreated. Is this kind of a sign of the perils of fiscal monetary cooperation in the sense that once they start meddling, they can meddle in any direction they want? I, I don't know about that. I, I would say almost uniquely, uh, there's many parts of Abenomics, which we can't go, you know, into all the details here, but monetary was from the beginning. Even during his election, he talked about monetary policy, how he wanted the Bank of Japan to get more inflation. And so, and then he won big, so he had a mandate. I think the public was with him up until I think the, sort of the concept of negative interest rates, I think, is what sort of has caused some of this issue, I think. And I think the Bank of Japan maybe needs better communication mm -hmm. uh, because, frankly, they will be able to get back to positive interest rates faster if they do more sooner. Yeah. It's sort of, uh, otherwise you just languish and things get worse. And I think they need to communicate that to the markets why they need to act boldly now. And what do you think, Tim? Do you think they've lost this expectations game, or is there still time yeah, look, for them to get the, back into it? I think that the story of Japan is there was this entrenched expectation that prices would stay even or even go down. The Bank of Japan started to change that, but then they didn't continue, and people reverted back. The worry is that you will go back. And the reason this matters is the Japanese government has an enormous amount of debt as a ratio to its GDP. Frankly, the only way that that debt becomes capable of being brought down is through a certain amount of inflation and growth. Without that, frankly, the prospects are extremely dim. And therefore, you know, Abenomics was this answer to Japan's long-term problems. And to now start thinking that Japan may go back into the pre-crisis issues, uh, uh, just basically stagnation, I think is a very worrying characteristic, not simply for Japan, but for the world. Yeah. It's just, a very big economy still. <laughs> just one little point is, they said they wanted two, and there's a sort of uh, interesting dynamic here, whereby if you can achieve two and sustain it, then it becomes self-sustaining, and you don't need to keep doing bold and new things. It kind of becomes part of the pattern. But if you set a goal and you don't achieve it, then I think you do risk sliding back. Uh, and that's why this is so troubling, you know, because they were so much on their way. Uh, but you can't just stop halfway and say, oh, that's good enough, because that's not what you told people. Sure. Well, Kuroda has implied that he also believes in the whatever it takes mantra, so we'll keep an eye and see whether or not they, they follow through. Yeah. Thank you guys so much for your time. Thank you, Petra.